The Legend of Zelda, one of the most well-known and well-received series. This beloved franchise has touched the hearts of many, inspired countless fan art, animation, songs, movies, you name it. It is astounding to have a game series have as many entries as Zelda does and have them all be well-received. Sure, some entries are better than others, but very few feel there are legitimately bad Zelda games. Stories told through Hyrule, Low Rule, Termina, and other realms all share the same fated hero, Link. Not always going by the name, but at least going by the identity, the Hero of Legend. Zelda was one of the main series I grew up with. It inspired me heavily, especially when it comes to my more original work. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't biased or heavily invested in the characters and tales woven by this franchise. Zelda was a part of my childhood, and it continues to fuel me in hopes that one day I could tell a story to inspire others the way that Zelda inspired me. As we dive through this series, it's safe to say that there will in fact be possibly one-sided views, unpopular opinions, and of course, Spoilers. Sure, not everyone loves the Zelda series, but almost anyone knows of it. Zelda paved the way for action-adventure games and even storytelling to a point. The settings, magic, music, story, and characters are memorable to all who play the games, even if the designs don't always make sense. Oh, uh, excuse me. I I'm looking for the leader of the Gorons. Oh, man. All right. I'll show you the way. Oh, no, no, no. You can just point. It's fine, really. No, no. It's fine. I'll, I'll just... <gasps> oh, my God! <laughs> oh, no. The pain is so bad. Why are your legs so brittle? Your body's the shape of a boulder. You have little twig legs. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Still got one. Get one. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? You did this! It was you! My blood is on your hands! I, I didn't... I, I told him he could just point! Alright, what seems to be the problem here? Uh, uh, officer down! Do it, son. Just pull the trigger. You've caused us enough pain already. Just make it end. Take the shot! Take the shot! Now, if you didn't know, there's a lot of Zelda games, so with this mini-series, I will only be covering the main console Zeldas. So, there's not gonna be any handheld Zeldas, spin-offs, or... Great! Or this. <laughs> to begin, we go back to the first Zelda, which was released in Japan on February 21st, 1986. The original Zelda was designed to be an anti-Mario of sorts, leading the player to explore and problem-solve, rather than just pressing on ahead for a very clear objective like in Mario. And boy, did they reach that because the first Zelda can be a little confusing to anyone going in blind. I mean, there's almost zero hand-holding in the game, minus a few cave hermits that give you cryptic metaphors. Other than that, you're on your own. There is nothing to tell you where to bomb, torch, or whatever. That's on you. Good luck, Binch! There's only like 50 million bajillion different tiles that can be affected by multiple different items. Not to mention, bombs are in high demand here, only allowing you to hold eight and you come along them few and far in between. Plus, as with the NES, some enemies are just dumb. They're, they're just dumb. The cursed pixies in this aren't tied to walls. They don't bounce in diagonal movement. They just move sporadically because that's, uh, that's, that's great. Yeah. Dark nuts can't be hit from the front and turn whenever they feel like it. Sure, they can be hit by bombs, but again, you need bombs all the time. It, that's, you need a bomb for that. That's a bomb. There's using that bomb. The game is a bit of a jumbled mess, but if you know what to do, it can actually be pretty enjoyable and rewarding minus some frustration with poor enemy designs. Just get ready to die and die and die and curse that you don't have more bombs and wander around aimlessly a bunch. Granted, most of these issues are just because of system limitations and lack of experience in developing games of this caliber, but Zelda was basically the first of its kind and brought around a unique item system and fun exploration. The bosses, despite being reused every other dungeon, were a refreshing change of pace from the generic wandering around somewhat aimlessly enemies. There is a decent amount wrong by today's standards, but at least it's not... Oh. Oh my god. Oh, it smells so fucking bad. 
All right, it's just Zelda 2. Now, it is popular to hate on this game, and we got them special snowflakes talking about how good it is, but let me let you in on a little secret. It's not. It's, it's not a good game. Zelda 2 looks at Zelda 1 and says, I want to beat that. If it was eaten, shat out, eaten again, and then that person's stomach gouged open and had Zelda pried out of its bloody corpse. The Adventure of Link gets rid of the top-down combat in exchange for ass. The emphasis was supposed to be on sword fighting, but most enemies just flail mindlessly, giving you very small openings, and the main foes you face seem to just perfectly block your attacks, making you either have to get lucky or cheese them. Which I doubt was the game's intention, because when I think of sword fighting, a small man jumping and swiping repeatedly is not really what comes to mind. Usable items are essentially gone. On. Instead, you have magic, which you need always and never have enough of. Healing can only be done in towns, or if you luck into a fairy zone, or by using magic, which again, you always need. There are no puzzles, just fighting. The boss fights can range from alright, to, uh, to, you know, not to mention the game is pretty fucking linear. There is some freedom, but most of the dungeons have an item that you need for the next or previous town to get a spell needed to access the next dungeon, and without a map, you better hope you luck into them before you come across any boss. Plus, the game relies on a lives system, which I mean in any game is just dumb. Live systems do nothing but pat out a game and mask it behind a veil of difficulty, which if you actually look past the veil, you just find a big old pile of shit. Some games, sure, it can be alright because it doesn't punish you too hard. It's not difficult or challenging to have run out of lives near the end of a dungeon and then go all the way back to the first area, run to the temple, crawl through it again, and hope that you didn't run out of lives this time. It's annoying. And that's all Zelda 2 is. Annoying. Punishing someone that hard is essentially starting someone out at their job, and any time that they get something wrong, you make them go through submitting another application and interviewing again to get their job back just to take another shot at a mistake. Oh, and the reason they made the mistake is because you kept throwing forks at them while they worked. It is dated, generic, side scrolly BS enemy NES Garbaggio. The music is pretty good, but there's only about six songs, and I hope you like transitioning from Overworld to Encounter nonstop because the random encounters are constant and tedious. Plus, the game just doesn't look that great. I know it's the NES, but everything just looks boring, and some of the color choices are disgusting. I mean, look at this fucking temple. Better yet, look at this temple when you're moving. I had to take eye drops after beating this because it hurt my eyes so badly. And that's how bad Zelda 2 is. It physically hurts me because of how bad it is. Then... <laughs> oh, then... Then came a link to the past. The favorite of many, and it for sure rests in my top five. This game was astounding, and it still is. It's aged wonderfully, and remains in the fond memories of most who have played it. You have tons of games nowadays trying to hit a retro feel, but they all go with this disgusting mesh of 16 and 8 bit with tons of gross overlays and bloom effects. Nah man, fuck that. You got 16-bit glory with fancy dancy mode 7 effects, complete with an amazing soundtrack that is constantly referenced in modern day Zeldas. Link to the Past showed how magical a game could be. Not to mention, this started a somewhat darker tone in the series. Before the game even starts, it shows off the corpse of Zelda's father. And when you begin, your uncle warns you to stay inside, providing an immediate sense of a threat. When you venture outside, you are greeted by a darkened world with rain falling from the sky, which, oh dang! That was pretty damn amazing back then. Add on to that the shade from the trees when roaming in the wood and seeing the view on top of Death Mountain. This game really helped you feel the world it was trying to show you. The enemies were tougher, the puzzles more complex. I mean, compared to the NES. Plus, there was a new arsenal of tools at your disposal. This game created so many staples of the Zelda series, it's ridiculous. Not to mention, alongside the darker side of the story, it also created the more lighthearted areas. NPCs had fun and varied dialogue, some areas were just there for giggles or Easter eggs. And of course, with this Zelda, we were introduced to one of the more well known staples of the series. Cuckoos get. Pissed. This was the first game that had the swarm of chickens envelop Link in a feathery fury dance of death, which even people who don't avidly play Zelda kind of know about this. But alongside all of that, the game already presented a huge overworld. As soon as you open the map, it looked gigantic. But a little ways through the game, zap blap wow, you're in the dark world, son! That map literally just doubled. Hosting even more dungeons with more items, power-ups, and fantastic bosses at the end. Bosses that 
felt like bosses, each one with its own unique moveset that wasn't just stand there and spit shit like bosses of the previous games. Except Blind. Fuck Blind! I don't need a goddamn bullet hell game in Zelda. There were side quests that weren't necessary to progress the game like the ones in Zelda 2. The heart pieces instead of containers rewarded the player for exploring more. There was basically a ton you could miss out on if you just went from dungeon to dungeon. Speaking of, the dungeon seemed massive with multiple floors. The big keys got you excited knowing it would unlock a path to the boss, and also the big chest containing your next item. Playing through it again, I still enjoyed it, with the only real downside for me being that sometimes it was a little difficult to maneuver, but the enemies were balanced, no bullshit tactics like previous Zeldas. A few issues were fixed too. The sword spin allowed for easier combat as opposed to Link's jabs from 1 and 2, plus bombable walls and surfaces were viewable. Even the ones that didn't have an obnoxious crack, you could actually rank a tank with Link sword to find out if a bomb would open that sucker up. The A button used a lot of commands, but it really only brought up issues in select circumstances. You may or may not view A Link to the Past as your favorite Zelda, but at least from a gameplay and technical standpoint, it's definitely up there, if not number one. The game looks, sounds, and above all, plays well. After that beauty, years went by, and we made the transition from 2D to 3D, thus spawning a very debated Zelda game, Ocarina of Time. This game to some is the greatest game ever made, and to others is overrated. In fact, the ratio has kind of shifted, and nowadays it seems like it's more popular to hate the game rather than love it. I rarely see too many people talking about it being the best game ever, but I see a lot of people complaining about it. To me, it's fun. It's a game and it's fun. I'm not really on either side, and so take that how you want. I mean, when it comes to Ocarina of Time, it's not really about whether the game is great or not, it essentially just boils down to people wanting to hear that they're right. So let me give you these sound bites. I think Ocarina of Time is a piece of shit. I think Ocarina of Time is the greatest game ever made. There you go, I side with your argument. I would maybe agree that at its release it could be considered the best, there wasn't a whole lot to compete with it, but the game hasn't really aged too well. Ocarina of Time threw the player into a 3D world, told a legend, and sent you on a quest. The magic and beauty of the game was stunning, and that alone was enough to blind a lot of gamers. The actual cinematic scenes of the game were just amazing, when prior to that, the most in-depth scene you really got was Bat Ganon smashing into the pyramid. The Z-targeting system made combat fun and effective, even in the new 3D environment that players weren't used to, which of course paved the way for a lot more 3D action adventure games. The game has its flaws, there's no doubts about that. For starters, it is painfully slow. The text crawls along the screen and there is no skipping it. Navi reminds you of things you already know or could figure out by, you know, looking at the screen, which just adds more text. Plus, everything needs a cutscene. Now granted, the actual story cutscenes were pretty amazing. It was so cool to see the goddesses with the Triforce, and the ones for the adult timeline only got more intense. But those should be saved for beating dungeons, plot progression, or boss intimidation. I shouldn't need a cutscene every time I step on a switch. I know what's going to happen. You don't have to jerk my head to the side and be like, remember that locked door that was right fucking in front of you when you got in the room? And then step through and have the game be like, oh no, the door's shut now. What? Oh, look at this. There's enemies here. What do we do, Link? What do we do? Only to fight the enemies and have the game again be like, wow, those enemies I pointed out sure are dead. Let's look at another door. Oh, it's open. Oh. Just stop! There is so much padding to the game. In Link to the Past, if you did something, bam, it was done. Maybe the game would give you a chime, which was basically just a pat on the back, good job, buddy. Whereas Ocarina of Time dimmed the lights and saying, we are the champions every time you took a bite out of the meal it prepared for you. Considering that the world was so big at the time, it's still a bit of a letdown that the story in Dungeon Road is pretty streamlined, offering little to no variety in your paths. There wasn't really as much of a reason to explore, or rather, no places to explore. The game basically takes you to every corner of the game, with very few areas that aren't touched on the main quest, which were mostly just little copy-paste caves that were hid under rocks. Plus, upon visiting it again, Hyrule Field is just... boring. 
There are almost no enemies during the day, which was a huge departure from every other Zelda. Still, the game did have some neat little features and side quests, plus a few easter eggs that took a bit more effort to find than other games. The game furthered the amazing music of Zelda, adding even more well-known additions to the soundtrack of the series. Hyrule Field, despite being empty, did amaze at first glance if just for that camera pan and music. Sure, it was tedious running across an empty field, but you did get some sense of progression. When you got a pony, you could just blast through the field with ease. But when you factor in the painfully slow, unskippable text, the obnoxious hand-holding and padding, and a few less-than-fun dungeons, it does start to weigh on you when you're not blinded by childlike wonder. Ocarina of Time was my first Zelda game that I fully completed. I didn't get into gaming too much until the N64. My family was pretty poor when the NES and SNES came out, so I could really only experience those consoles at friends' houses or stores. But with Ocarina of Time, it, it was mine. Well, more so after a young me accidentally deleted my father's save, causing him to never play through it again, but at that point, it was mine. I went through that journey, and as a wide-eyed boy with the ability to name the character after me, yeah, that's right, I self-inserted. And before you get all pissy about that, if one of you can honestly say you'd prefer being a kid in society, or working a 9-to-5 job over living in the world of Hyrule, you either got the illest fucking job in the world, or you're blowing some hot steamy shit right out your mouth. I digress. To me, I was Link. I did go on that journey. I fought the monsters and I saved the villages. It made me feel like I was special, as cheesy as that was. It was my first real feeling of accomplishment and what instilled my love of games at that point. It told a story that inspired me to make my own and let me live through an adventure I wanted to lead others on as well. Ocarina of Time is not my favorite game of all time and it isn't even in my top three. But it is what inspired a lot of who I am. Granted, not so much the salty, angry, gamey rant guy, but more the original and artistic side of me. And for that, it'll always have a special place in my heart. It is not the best game, and it's a bit of a chore to play through nowadays. If nothing else, the game is unique in the ridiculous glitches it created, which of course fed into the speedrunning community. Hell, the things speedrunners did to this game alone makes me kind of like it more. Sure, it isn't intentional, but with some of the speedrun routes, even if you aren't that fast, can still give you some more freedom to the game than it was originally designed to give you. And I mean, come on, how on earth did someone figure out how to do the wrong warp? Hell, how do people figure out 90% of glitches anyway? To this day, people speedrun the game constantly, with a large set of routes and rules for various forms of play. The game has its flaw, but if a game can still conjure up this much activity, I think it's a bit one-sided to say it's completely bad, even if it isn't your cup of tea. The main issues with Ocarina of Time essentially boil down to the fact that we grew up. Nintendo pretty much focuses on the child audience, so the older we get, the more flawed these games become. But again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. A couple years went by and Majora's Mask then came to consoles. This is my favorite Zelda game, and a lot of people will judge me on that. And I mean, yeah, like they kind of have a right to. The game rubbed some people the wrong way as they couldn't get a handle on the time system or even get over the fact that it reused assets from Ocarina of Time. But it was a brand new game. Sure, the core gameplay was the same, but you had a new world, new dungeons, new music, new stories, and new characters. E even if some of them shared the same face as a previous one. The game was also a direct sequel to Ocarina of Time, which was what started to make the other games feel like they were all connected. It was also significantly darker. In the beginning, Link's just taking a slow, solemn trot with Epona down a darkened forest path. You progress a little bit, and as soon as you make that- What? Look, he just did a goddamn flip a dip dip Sure, it doesn't seem like much, but the first time I ever saw that, I was freaking out. It was a difference from the little hip-hops Link took in Ocarina of Time and further solidified in my mind that this was in fact the same Link. A seasoned fighter trapped in a young boy's body, ready to face any obstacle without hesitation. I mean, that's reading into it, but that's what I got. The game is stuck on a loop of three days, giving the player the ability to slow, speed up, or even turn back time. A lot of people hated this feature, and sure, it's not the best. I've really only had it bite me in the ass once when I was in the Great Bay Temple fighting George and had the clock run out on me due to poor management, which led to a heavy bout of anger. Fuck that fish. But that's what it came down to, management. Which admittedly was a little new for Zelda gamers. Prior to this, we really only had to deal with item management, not time management. When you actually dive into the game, the whole tone of it is despair and hopelessness. Everyone fears the entity of the moon, which even now is still pretty damn creepy slash silly. 
They all fear it'll fall. Some openly express it, others hide behind their denial, but ultimately, everyone is scared. This was new to me. Even in Ocarina of Time, everyone seemed to be like, ah, oh, it's all good, someone's gonna kick this dude's shit in. But everyone was terrified in Majora's Mask. NPCs weren't much in previous installments, but the ones in this game had schedules, families, personalities, they had their own story to tell. Sure, Ocarina of Time sent me to a new world and on a quest, but this game let me live in it. I could get to know these characters, pass a line or two of dialogue, and even help some of them on their own journeys. Well, to a point. Part of the charm and draw for me when it comes to Majora's Mask is simply the overarching feeling that you can't help everyone. No matter how often you turn back time, someone will still wind up hurt by the end. The characters whose bodies you inhabit through their masks will still remain deceased even if you complete all the quest lines and fight Majora at the end. The game also scared me pretty bad as a kid. I mean, the whole game was pretty dark, but I mean, when I got to Akana Valley and there were these hooded red lanky ass motherfuckers, mummies surrounding a house, and then of course... <laughs> It spooked me, which I hadn't seen much of in a game outside of Reedheads from Ocarina of Time. Sure, my dad played things like Resident Evil when I was little, which was spooky, but I was expecting spooks. To have it in a Zelda game was basically having a place called Sunshine Valley, free french fries inside. And when you get inside, everyone's dead and maimed and it's so sick you can't even enjoy your french fries. Every part of the game just filled me with emotions and still does to this day. I even try speedrunning it here and there. And this game too offers some pretty fun and unique paths that go against the predestined Woodfall Snowhead Great Bay Econa route that the game clearly wants you to do. Which was one of my gripes about the game. The world does feel a little closed off. It felt less like a gigantic realm and more of a hub a la Mario 64, with the four areas essentially being paintings. Plus it too followed the already dated formula Ocarina of Time used with having areas be locked behind needing items you could only receive by completing a previous area. Something that could have fixed that would have been having all the sub areas join together somehow, make the world feel a little more connected. It did do a decent job allowing you to see the landmarks of other areas in your current area though. But one thing that does help was the ability ability to warp very early on, with many places to warp to. Any owl statue you activate becomes a warp point, making it very easy to get around. The masks were great, each one giving you some new ability, stat boost, or unlocking parts of a side quest, which as mentioned, the game had plenty of, and got much more in depth than just go over there and grab that please. You'd need to learn of character schedules and snoop around a bit too. Plus the kafai cafe. the Andrew quest is just fantastic, bringing you into a little puzzle gauntlet where you can control an NPC. Some side quests did just yield money, but rupees were actually needed in this game. The game just promoted exploration. Even in dungeons, tying unique power-ups and items behind rescuing all the stray fairies from any location. But despite all of that, it also gave you access to essentially three new playable characters that didn't really take too much time to jump into. They were basically a powered up link for a set area, even the whippy little Deku could be used to stun enemies and slobber over them for simple damage techniques. The Goron is a blast to play as, rolling around like a fucking Sonic character and those punches, mmm. The Zora is fun too when you're in the water areas getting to flip around like a dolphin, but they, they kind of ruined that in the 3DS one. But having those forms didn't limit Link's gameplay outside of a few dumb designs of quick swaps between human to a different race. The game was filled with charming side quests, symbolism, complex themes, and some of my favorite dungeons in the entire series. Plus it has a lot more micro dungeons which are pretty fun. Ocarina of Time when having those was basically a little hallway with maybe a silver rupee puzzle in there. Majora's Mask has an entire area devoted to sneaking around and fighting mini bosses, as well as a castle filled with traps and dead things. I always have fun whenever I jump back into Majora's Mask, hell at the moment I can beat it in like 6 hours, which isn't amazing, but always makes for a fun single session play. I think I'm always drawn to it because despite having the cartoony, almost anime look of Zelda, it still gets dark. Which for me is always a pull, hell a few of you may have seen my original series, Sig and Tessa. Look at it, look at how fun it is, look at how oh, they're all happy and whatnot. I'm gonna make them suffer when the series actually kicks off. I'm gonna make them cry and it's Majora's Mask's fault. When the GameCube had come out, a few tech demos were released. The infamous Space World demo showing a more detailed Ocarina of Time Link fighting Ganondorf had raised hype levels to all who were fans of the series. And then... <laughs> A lot of people hated the Wind Waker style, some still do. But as someone who was getting into animation at the time, I fell in love with it. Hell, I even tried mimicking the style quite a few times in my early days of drawing. Wind Waker was the first game I had seen such cartoony actions and characters. Sure, previous entries had unique and memorable characters perhaps doing cartoonish things, but even back then, there was still more of a 3D feeling. Wind Waker felt like a cartoon for me. The style and colors of the game had caught my eye in no time flat, and when I set out on that journey, it started with one of my 
favorite pieces of music from the entire franchise. The opening of the game starts off with a legend. Not a tale of what's happening present day, not a tree mumbling to a fairy, it tells a legend. Of Zelda! Soon after, you awake to a boy napping in pajamas, which was kinda cute. It made Link finally feel like more of a fleshed out character, someone a bit more relatable. Sure, he had an uncle and Link to the past in a Kikiri and Ocarina of Time, but he was always just kinda standoffish almost. Wind Waker also brought expressions to the character of Link. Prior to this, he really only had his idle sprites in the earlier games, and in the N64, he had maybe 10 unique cutscene animations. In Wind Waker, he's constantly changing expressions. Dancing around, getting dizzy, all sorts of things. Link finally felt like more of a character rather than a conduit. The gameplay kept the Z-targeting of previous entries and added some fancy new moves and a parry ability. This is a bit of a gripe though. Parrying is nifty and flashy, but it does simplify combat. A lot of foes can be fought simply by WAIT FOR THE GIANT FLASHING A BUTTON. But despite easy combat, it's still pretty fun. Even more so in the areas where you get to fight multiple biggies at once, which actually happens pretty often and always feels pretty butt-tingly and triumphant whenever you beat them. The one-on-one -on -one fights might be a little weaker than other entries though. The dungeons I actually feel were probably the weakest part, which I'm sure people will disagree with me. Dragon Roost and Forest Haven wound up feeling the most like dungeons, offering up tiny challenges and some puzzle solving, whereas in the next dungeons you gain the command melody. Which is one of my least favorite aspects of the game. It allows you to take control over another character, the first one being a tiny hippity hop statue, which are literally just move. No specials, it's it's just kind of tedious and, and, and boring. Look at him go! Especially because in order to take control, you must play the song. In the GameCube version, the Wind Waker was an item, so you'd have to use up a slot to make sure you could swap back and forth. In the HD version, it is tied to the D-pad, but you still have to play it every time. Plus, in later dungeons where you control Birdface and Jingle Butt, you do have active abilities with A, which can actually be kind of gross, because in select areas, you won't be able to jump because you'll be forced to use your ability instead, since it's mapped to the same key. I really hoped in the HD remake, they would have just given you a button for a quick swap, but Nope. They also could have done something similar to Majora's Mask, where the two characters just kind of take turns. I enjoy the Earth Dungeon, but the constant swapping of characters can be a bit obnoxious. The Air Dungeon sucks, though. Yeah, Makar's cute, but the Air Dungeon's just dumb. It's just a giant central room done bad. Every puzzle is, okay, use either the Iron Boots or the fucking Hookshot. Just do it! At least with the Earth Dungeon, I had to do some clever shit with mirror reflections. With only a few dungeons, and most being meh, it's kind of a letdown. But despite the Met Dungeons, the bosses are pretty great. And gigantic. Some of them towering over Link, but again, with simplified combat. Each boss is fought with use item you got in dungeon and then well for three cycles, but most Zeldas do that. Wind Waker at least makes it feel satisfying with its sound effects and animations. Helma Rock is piss easy, but it feels good to smack that cock's head with your skull hammer. Th that, uh, th that's, that's not sexual. Th it the game, instead of using the previous Hyrule field connected to sub-areas, it had this gigantic ocean with tons of islands to explore. Some were close to pointless, sure, but it was pretty cool slowly filling up your map with all those different locales. It gave you a lot more reason to want to explore. But this also drew into one of the gripes about Wind Waker. The sailing. On the GameCube, it was really bad having to swap the wind around constantly for good speed. But with the remake, they at least offered the swift sail, removing that necessity. Even then, it's just a bit... Baron. Sure, there's a few things here and there to amuse you, like jumping over barrels or swimming between them, but more often than not, you find yourself sailing towards a new area and then just waiting until you arrive. Maybe dodging a shark or two, but still just... Just waiting. Zelda loves to wait. The items, however, seem to get some pretty rad upgrades. Previous favorites, like the Boomerang, got multi-target abilities, and others, like the Hookshot, got new uses combined with the Iron Boots. As mentioned, the Skull Hammer was satisfying, albeit basic and the Deku Leaf was a giggle and a half to use, even if it cost magic to fly around. The pacing could be rather poor at times. For instance, in the start, you fight for two of these pearls through giant dungeons and huge bosses. And the third is just... Yeah, you got it. Fire and ice arrows seemed cool, but they were really only used to unlock two items to unlock more items. They were basically a, oh, you progressed this far? All right, let me just fucking unlock this part of the game for you. Go ahead. The game pads length too with the sailing, and even in the remake, the Triforce quest is pretty stupid. Most parts have you snag a map piece, which you have to pay a fortune to decipher, and then you go to the area to fish out the piece. And this was after going through the same place in two different locations. The Savage Labyrinth was pretty neat, having you fight every 
every enemy you have faced in the game thus far. Which made me wish that instead of having the entire quest, maybe the labyrinth was just a little longer, and at the end, we could fight a unique boss. Like, how much cooler would it have been if at the end of the labyrinth we fought Shadow Link and then got the Triforce? BAM! I, f I fixed it. I fixed the quest. A lot of people love Wind Waker Ganondorf, and uh, he's pretty cool, but... Where, where is he 90% of the game? I, well, I know he's like in the tower, but like where's his presence? People fell in love with him for like five minutes of dialogue at the end of the game. So imagine if he had more of an impact or influence on the rest of the journey. It was pretty intense feeling the progression of returning to the Forsaken Fortress, rescuing your sister, scaling the Helmrock's room, and then fighting the beast on top with a starlit sky in the background and the spotlights illuminating the backdrop. After downing the beast, you sport your nifty new Master Sword ready to take on G-Tier and then, oh, whoops, you still suck. But don't worry, Valu's got your back. Like that part combined with Hyrule before and after were just phenomenal. So I don't even want to get into, okay, I'm gonna get into it. What's with Ganon's tower in this? It's just a ton of boss rehashes where it doesn't even let you use your new items to face them. Also just, Gee, I wonder what I do. But the battles in the game are fun. Fighting Dark Nuts are a donk and always a blast. Grabbing loot from enemies was pretty amazing too, especially since each one contributed to side quests. Sure, the game pats itself, but when you're really in it, you're in it, and it's quite the journey. The game satisfies more than others. I mean, if nothing else, Toon Link, or whatever you want to call him, is just great. He is just a dude. His sister gets kidnapped, and he's not having none of that shit. Teams up with random pirates because he's so determined, braves the fortress by himself, battles gigantic beasts, and then dad boats like, Nah, he's not the hero of time, but he doesn't give a shit. He didn't even luck into Hylia being like, yeah, whatever, here's the Triforce because you're Link or whatever, like Ocarina of Time Link had. Motherfucker had to fish it out of the sea to earn that bitch, piece by piece. A uh, Sword of Evil's Bane is fucked up? Well, guess he'll just fucking fix it on top of being a certified badass. He might as well be the fucking janitor to rewire the blade and clean up evil. And also, I have to touch on this. Listen to this. talk? Does Link clearly have dialogue options? Do all those stupid fucking animations where the punchline is uh, Link can't speak or only speaks in he has make zero sense and just seem like a bad cop out done to death joke? Cause this isn't even the first game he clearly had dialogue options. If you've ever made that joke, congrats! You're a bad writer slash comedy artist. Even worse than someone who rants about a series and repeats things and goes off topic nonstop. Where was I? All right. In the early 2000s, Brown and Bloom was the big old thing. The gaming audience had grown up and wanted edge and realism. Nintendo had backlash about Wind Waker being too kid-friendly and looking childish, so what's their response? Why, a watered-down version of Ocarina of Time featuring Edge and Shadow the Hedgehog from the Devil May Cry series. Not to mention the game is just... Uh, it's just a little uncomfortable. Ah, what a beautiful day outside. The grass is brown, the sky is bloom, and everything- OH MY GOD! Hi, Link! Even though I'm one of the children, I'll still sport constant bad eyes and moan at everything you do! <coughs> oh. mm. I'm a foot fetish! Mm. Link, quit clucking with those heads and come slap my titties in my basement like a man! Turn into a furry and let me ride you. <laughs> but. So, let's just dive into one of the main parts of the game, the wolf. The least fun gimmick of any Zelda. Yeah, even more so than the motion controls of Skyward Sword. But the wolf just feels out of place. It doesn't really add anything to gameplay elements, and it certainly doesn't add anything to story elements. It's just... It's just kind of there. The wolf combat is incredibly dull, making it difficult to hit something directly in front of you. It promotes only attacking using the Midna Hold B to win, or spamming Lock On Jump Attack. Jump attacking has its drawback too, with Wolf Link having to shake and toss smaller foes to the side after. Not to mention that Wolfie doesn't get any new abilities like regular Link, so you're just kind of stuck with this weighted and dull combat for the entire game. The emphasis should have been on speedy combat, allowing Link to attack with momentum similar to that of the Midna move. Plus, tagged onto the wolf is of course the tier 
tiers of light. These tiers are necessary to dispel the twilight and are gathered by running around the new area that you're gonna have to run around in later and killing bugs. Which means you have to get annoyed at dumb wolf combat. None of the bugs are really difficult to find or retrieve, the most complex ones being brought out by a very obvious, hmm, do I fire here? There's also barely any threat when you do this. Take as much time as you want, and here, we'll only toss one or two regular monsters at you. The bugs don't really attack you outside of a very slow electric buzz in your general direction. Plus, I really don't know why there's all these designated Minda jump areas. You have a set spot, call Minna, then target her, and basically mash A. Periodically, it offers one or two obstacles in the way, but they rarely actually interfere with you. The ice falling is probably the only one to punish people for just mashing. It's not the worst, but it just... It feels like they saw people have fun with the Donkey Kong barrels and were like, yeah, okay, let's do that, but if it sucked. Even with skippable cutscenes, it still has a bit of a slow pace. Minna has plenty of obvious and unskippable dialogue. Things still have unnecessary cutscenes, like in the first dungeon. When you use the Gale Boomerang on the bridge, it shows a cutscene. Why? We've seen the bridges spinning prior to this. You can showcase what an item does by just having it. Do it! Hell, to even get to the first dungeon, you have to go there three times. Once to rescue Dumbo, once to rescue Monko, and then only on the third time can you actually go in. Similar to that, the howling is even dumber. This is done to open up paths or unlock new moves, but to do it, you need to listen, howl it, hear the wolf howl it, cutscene, howl again, and then listen to a longer howl. Why? It's so unnecessary and repetitive, but that's... That's just what Twilight Princess is. The game forces you into these mini-games all too often, and none of them are that great. I'm fine with mini-games, just make them fun. Like, who thought the goats were a good idea? Are they supposed to teach me how to use my horse? You know what does that? Leaving the farm. Most of the game is just backtracking, and until you get the Master Sword, you are unable to warp as you please when human. Which just makes it less satisfying when you get it too, because you're just kind of sitting there like, why... Why couldn't I do this in the first place? Instead, you need to truck through a dull Hyrule field over and over, where there are almost no threats. I'm aware there's a few monsters, but that brings me to my next point. The AI in this game is so dumb. Almost nothing hurts you unless you're trying. Enemies very openly telegraph all their attacks, either allowing you to counter or dodge in giant windows. Hell, even the bosses hardly even bother attacking you for their fights. The mini-bosses actually make an attempt, but they're so tame about it that while you're barging into their domain, they set the table for you while you raid their stuff and they're like, can I get you anything? Hearts? Rupees? You look like you're getting a little low on my weakness bombs. I could... I could spot you some if you like. The designs of everything vary. Most things are stuck in this weird middle ground of cartoony and realistic that just dives into the whole uncanny valley thing. Other designs look pretty good, and enemies all look like some deviant artist's dark rendition of beloved Zelda enemies. Some bosses and mini bosses do look cool, but the majority just scream try hard. Battling anything can be obnoxious too. Swordplay is super dull in this game. You do have basic Zelda attacks, but they just feel sloppy since most were made to highlight the Waku controls in the Wii version of the game. The animations really show. Most just seem lifeless or only move one limb while others remain stationary or part of another animation. Other things just seem lazy, like opponent jumping over tall fences. It really just looks like someone either turned on a moon jump code or the animators literally just raise around the z-axis. The horse is poorly controlled as well, stopping from high speed at very idiotic areas. It's difficult to turn in pinches, but to be fair, all Zelda horses control like poo poo. Horse combat was praised, but I find it stale. It's just the stale regular combat, but moving. What's... What's so great about that? Hell, when you're moving with enemies, it's almost like everyone's just standing still. It's also been mentioned too that most items are absolutely useless outside of their dungeon, which makes getting them bittersweet. The only one you really take to the end is the boomerang and claw shots. The others are used in tiny amounts or maybe in side quests, which there are an extreme lack of. However, despite all of these gripes, Twilight Princess does have some good music scores, even if most are recycled. For bosses, the music has a triumphant theme whenever you get them to its vulnerable state, which is pretty fun. And their dungeon designs are actually pretty Pretty good outside of lake bed. The Snow Peak Ruins is one of the most unique dungeons in the series. You run around gathering ingredients for a soup, which kind of gives you a checkpoint every time. Plus, the layout is just a mansion. It doesn't even seem out of place like a Resident Evil mansion. The motif in it is great. No dungeony feeling rooms in it. Nothing that really sticks out. It just feels like an actual piece of architecture that just got overrun by monsters. However, as with most of the dungeons, when you get to the end, you just have a lackluster boss fight. Alongside that, this game is so linear that if you use some glitches to clip into areas you normally need items from the previous dungeon, the game just says, oh, well, he's got plot points and gives you pieces of fused shadow or mirrors of twilight. With glitches, you can skip the Goron Mines entirely, as well as the Temple of Time, and you only need to grab the ball and chain from Snow Peak to deal 
deal damage to Zant later on. You can just leave after you pick it up. Which is satisfying because this Zelda locks you on a path harder than any other one in the past. This story is fairly weak as well, having plenty of plot holes. Link is a wolf because... why, exactly? Oh, it's the Sacred Beast. Well, where in the timeline has it ever mentioned that? If anything, shouldn't it be a bird? Why do the Bulbins kidnap the kids in Ilya but leave Link? Plus, they just drop him off unharmed at Kakariko Village? The whole Mirror of Twilight is supposedly the only way between realms, yet plenty of characters jump back and forth without it. No one in Castletown even seems to realize they've been overthrown. They're all just bumming around town. Plus, Ganon... Ganon just... It just doesn't make sense here. Plus, he's bad. He's a, he's a bad G-Dorf. Wind Waker showed that even with minimal dialogue, Ganondorf could have more drive behind his actions. Twilight Princess Ganondorf just wants to take over because he's evil. Plus this deal with the ancient sages either retcon Ocarina of Time or spit on it. I, I'm not really sure. Ganon just kind of shoehorns his way in at the end and kills any chance Zant had at being interesting, who up until the ending was a cool character. The interactions that him and Midna had were just fantastic. This whole like royalty battle and everything, I, I loved it. But by the end of it, the only one who shows any growth is Midna, who is one of my favorite characters in the series, not just because she gives me wowsters in my trousers. Basically, she starts out as a bitch, gets her ass handed to her, becomes tolerable while still keeping some of the bitch tendencies. Plus, we also got this scene from her. That is graphic, and I love it. I want more death in Zelda. All in all, Twilight Princess is not the strongest Zelda. It doesn't bring anything to shine above others, but I'd still say it's worth at least one playthrough. The gripes aren't too bothersome to most individuals. I'm just a little picky sometimes, but be prepared to get frustrated at controls fairly often, and don't expect to be wowed by much outside of a few designs. At this point, it's pretty obvious if you haven't played it at all to start with the HD one. It didn't change much, but it fixed a few issues like constantly reminding you what a blue rupee is, and decreasing the amount of tears needed to get in each area. Because even though most of this section was complaints, I still found myself having fun at parts while I gathered footage because even if it's a watered down, edgy version of Ocarina of Time, well that still means it's sort of fun. It is a Zelda game, not that the title alone gives it a pass. It was a weak one, sure, but when the foundation is strong, it can still entertain to a point. Now, this always gets me some groans whenever I mention or talk about my views on it, so let's just get started. Skyward Sword. Boy, is it popular to hate this game. People complaining about almost every aspect of it. The padding, the backtracking, the hand-holding, the controls, and much more. But despite all the people screaming that it sucks, I, I like it. I do. I even tried to hate it. When I started playing it again to get the footage, I did my usual of attempting to speedrun using redonk glitches to cut down on my playtime. At first, while I streamed it, I was repeatedly getting frustrated, but while I was streaming, I was sitting, I had headphones on which crossed some wires, and I was trying to be entertaining for chat. At the end of that stream, I was considering finding an alternative to get footage, but then I remembered how I played it when I first did. The wide-eyed younger me sporting his Link tunic shirt and excited that I could move the Wiimote as if it was a sword. So, I got into it. I stood up, and I made broad swings for combat, and well, the game just instantly got better. Immersing myself in it really helped me enjoy it further, without having to worry about being comedic or getting embarrassed if I fuck up. I just played. And it was great! Sure, there's still a lot wrong with the game, so for fairness sake, I'll try and do a one and one One good, one bad. So to start with good, holy wow do I love the aesthetics of this game. The animations, the expressiveness of the characters, the designs, the entire style of it. The watercolor painting motif just has such lush and wonderful colors that honestly create some of the best looking areas in the whole series. Plus the soundtrack is definitely up there with my favorites. There's so many wonderful and unique tracks, some just for fun and others to accompany the amazing and more cinematic cutscenes of the game. However, to experience that, you need to maneuver around, and to do that now, you have stamina. Running drains your stamina really fast, reducing you to a slow shuffle if you run out. You're unable to upgrade the stamina too. Only get potions to delay or refill it. There are stamina fruits here and there that completely refill your gauge, but but they're not always in the best place, and there's no guarantee there will be one in your way. I'm not against stamina in games. I love it in something like Monster Hunter. You just lose it way too fast, and when it's used for your main method of movement, it can be a bit taxing. Something that could have been done here would be to, of course, have a few more stamina fruits and maybe give Link a little speed boost as the stamina increases instead of just instantly filling. Kind of like a burst of energy the fruits could give. That would almost make it like its own little mini game akin to the Tears of Light sections. Wait a second, is that a segue into a good? Yeah it is!
So in Twilight Princess, I hated the Tears of Light section. There was just nothing going on. No threat, it took forever, and also looked gross. But in Skyward Sword, you've got this neat motif of basically a calm, spiritual night. At least until you step out of your bubble, and then- OH GOD! So the tears fend off the Guardians, which are one-hit killers. On top of them, you have little orbs that create beacons showing where the next tier is. There's no combat, no items, just running and collecting, and it's fun. The tears refill your stamina akin to fruit, and there are a lot of them around, so you can breeze through these areas with a set path. It's fun seeing how fast you can collect them, and even if you get a bit turned around, the fruit can highlight the ones you missed. But those sections come when you start backtracking. Part of Skyward Sword's terrible Patomatic Padding Patapalooza, which this game unfortunately has a lot of. So many things you do cause you to just wait around. Skyloft is your hub, and you can fly around this gross empty sky of nothing. There are giant beacons of light to jump into the provinces, and you can choose any of the save statues that you've activated to fall down to. Some areas when you revisit bring you to completely new zones, but you still have to wade through an area you've already been through once or twice to get there. Hell, it even makes you go through the same dungeon again. Not fully, but enough, which is dumb. Again though, to even get there, you have to go through the dumb overworld, which honestly had a multitude of ways it could have been fixed. One is make it more appealing, obviously. My personal idea would be to shrink the entire overworld and have dark clouds or some plot device cover most of the three provinces, which could possibly be connected. I like connected worlds, okay? Saving at a statue would essentially shoot a beam up and clear the clouds in the area, so that when you're flying, you could drop down to the stage similar to how you can drop down in a skyloft based on where you actually dive. But that alone wouldn't fix the issues of having to go back to the same areas again and again. Sure, it was unconventional for Zelda, but it was also just unnecessary. That's one thing that Zelda tries to do, is be new. It added a lot of new mechanics that were even brought over to Breath of the Wild. The stamina meter, despite being aggravating sometimes, was kind of a neat feature for combat, since you couldn't just spam sword spins like other games. You have the ability to upgrade items alongside your equipment, plus the provinces were basically mini dungeons, and some of them were really cool. I mean, the whole section utilizing time crystals in the ocean was insanely neat. It was fun not enemies out of the time bubble and watching them just fade to bones. That whole area just brought you from one trial to another. It didn't feel like running up Death Mountain or walking across Hyrule Field. It was just constant action. Even after those areas, you still get a traditional temple, and most of them in this are pretty great. There weren't too many bullshit things that the temples revolved around. It was mostly just go around, solve puzzles, and fight shit. Not too much padding done in the actual dungeons at least the first time you go there. But one thing they did lack was enemy variety. True, the enemies were unique to fight in this game due to the motion controls. There's just so few types. Every area features their own version of the Bokoblin. Hell, even the Redeads got Bokobbled. Bosses are reused, which is just always kind of gross to see. I don't like that in any game outside of a boss rush. Skyward Sword did actually have some fantastic boss fights, though. I mean, the Ancient Automaton is my favorite fight in the series. It's just so satisfying fighting him. You yank the motherfucker's arms off, and the tiny rumbles in the Wiimote help you feel it every time you make the motion. And after you kick his stationary ass, he pulls a you fucking didn't, you little bitch. And just gets up, whips out more swords, and comes after you. Only then do you get to rip those arms off, grab the swords, shatter his legs, and slash open his chest. It was just satisfying. Like, cause you know me, I'm always getting schniz on the reg cause of how charismatic I am. But post-coitus, I always roll off to the side and pull out the picture of the ancient automaton just wishing that the shrump down felt even half as good as that fight. But then you also have... <laughs> but even past that with Girahim and the Imprisoned, you have to fight them both three times. Peppermint Kisses takes up the boss slot in two temples as well, which is a huge letdown. At least the Imprisoned stayed in his fucking pit and didn't Kool-Aid his way through a dungeon wall or something. Which I guess brings me to my next point, the combat. I, I, I lost track, are we good or bad? Well, whatever, as much as people will shout at me, I thought the combat was fun. But Scott, motion controls! Yo, what about them? You have to look at this for what it is. A fully fleshed out game utilizing motion controls. That's insane. How many other games are as long and content filled as Skyward Sword while having a unique control style that even nowadays still hasn't really been perfected? Heck, I know it messes up and it's annoying when it does, but when it works, hot diggity daffodil does it work. Sword combat is satisfying in this game because you're the one doing it. This was the fun I was talking about. When I play this game, I get up and I swing that Wiimote like it was a sword. 
hard. Every enemy is a mini puzzle in itself. Timing is key for them. Sure, they telegraph attacks, but it's because you have to think. Swiping the wrong way will get your attack blocked or deflected and generally countered. But even if they do attack you, you can shake the nunchuck to parry with your shield, which was so cool. Parrying an enemy and unleashing some sword spins on them really helped me feel the power behind my attacks. Enemies, mini bosses, regular bosses all just felt so much better to beat than in previous titles because I was the one beating them essentially. I didn't just press A at a good time, I swung my sword at a good time. Aiming was easier with the motion controls too instead of the C stick or pad. Most of the weapons were just fun to use with emotion. Tossing bombs was easier, giving you the little trajectory reticle. This was however all dependent on if the motion controls were responding, which for me, I didn't have too many issues once I got off my ass and did the broader motions, but it is easily enough to spoil anyone's experience of the game, and by no means am I saying that this game gets a pass because they worked for me. If a large fraction of players experienced issues in it, then it is in fact a problem. Now, the next point is kind of good and bad. Fi. Or Fee. Whatever you want to call her. I'm gonna call her Fi, so whatever. Fi is hated by many because she does not shut up. She warns you if your health is low, if your batteries are low, she tells you about dumb items you've already found, and she calculates that there's a 95% chance that you're standing on grass. It's really ironic she doesn't have hands because all she does is hold yours. But when you factor out the gameplay side of it, I... I like Fi as a character. She was a cute little android basically designed to help the hero on his quest and teach him about the land he was unfamiliar with. Plus, I mean, come on. Fi's farewell, it just... My heart. Which brings me to my last point for this. The story. I loved it. Sure, it retconned a lot of stuff and started some timeline fuckery, but on its own, it was a treat to dive through. Seeing Link and Zelda as childhood friends was adorable and heartwarming, and the characters they met along the way had such vivid and charismatic personalities that it just drew me further into this world. Peppermint Kisses was my favorite Zelda villain too. He was just a spoiled brat that wanted to resurrect his senpai, but done in a tasteful way that was divulged early instead of being dumped on you at the end like Zant. The dragons were pretty cool, and some of the newer races were either silly or just fucking adorable. Plus Groot. Gruus is great. I love seeing a character go through dynamic change like he does. Starting the game as the neighborhood bully, but then getting the hots for a grandma and then being pretty alright. The cutscenes were very cinematic, having wonderful tones, very expressive characters, and very touching scenes. Not only did I ball like a bitch at Fi's farewell, but man, when Zelda locked herself away, that hit me hard. The first time I played through the game was with an old girlfriend I was pretty into at the time. We were dorks and basically self-inserted, her wishing she was Zelda and me wanting to be Link. So when Zelda locked herself away and you could see the pain in Link's expression, as well as the fear behind his fists as he was pounding on the self-made prison. It just... It just fucked me up. I still kinda get teary-eyed thinking about it. Seeing the person you care about the most forced to go against their wishes for the good of the world... Uh, anyway. Skyward Sword is no means the best Zelda game. Far from it. The controls can work, but when they don't, it just feels kinda gross. The game treats you like a kid most of the time, and some of the choices it made were just really poor. I think people give it such a bad rap because it's a Zelda game, and it didn't live up to the legend that the name has behind it. But I'd still enjoy the game even if some shit was renamed and we had an entirely different main character and princess without the title. Still, I don't think people need to avoid this game as much as the internet wants you to believe. It's not something I need to play through over and over again. But I mean, if they released an HD version in a couple of years, I'd sure as hell pick it up, if nothing else to see those visuals in 1080p or even 4K. The game has easy fixes, but when you look at Breath of the Wild directly after playing Skyward Sword, you realize that a lot of the issues were molded into beloved and praised features for the new game. Not all of them, mind you. Breath of the Wild, despite constant 10, still has some pretty glaring issues. I mean, first of all, game journalists are hacks, but that's a whole nother thing, and I don't honestly believe any game with DLC you need to buy in order to experience the whole story can be considered perfect, but that's a whole nother thing! The point is, the game has flaws. It's not immune to them, just like previous Zeldas. Now before you spill your chalky milk or choke on your tendies, I'll start off by telling you I do really enjoy Breath of the Wild. We're gonna tackle the bad and acknowledge the good along the way, and sum it up with some more good. The easiest way to do this is using the handy dandy list I have here on the big old issues of Breath of the Wild. Wild, in parentheses, and also any future Zelda game utilizing a similar engine or maybe even the DLC if we ever find anything out about it. So let's see the areas of issue. Now, these seem like a lot and big things to be issues, but them being listed doesn't mean they're entirely bad. The easiest example is, of course, 
So this game was announced way back in 2013, and the main teaser we got of it was back when it was a Wii U exclusive three years ago. As time marched onwards, we only got snippets about once a year as it was delayed repeatedly. Finally, years later, we started to get images and trailers getting to see more of what this world was and the overarching story. The first actual trailer showed off so much and it was stunning. The thing that captivated me the most was the appearance of Calamity Ganon. The concept seemed so mystifying, so powerful. The gameplay footage and whatnot suggest a collapsed timeline and fans started speculating wildly and holy wow was it fun. When the loading image was leaked and showed a figure face to face with the Calamity with what appeared to be red hair, I first thought to myself, oh wow. Could this be a story about Ganondorf trying to separate himself from the entity of Demise's curse? I mean, Link's gauntlets had Gerudo designs on them. That was my main hope, some bleak timeline with them trying to combat their destiny. When I got the actual game, I was always ready for some insanely amazing moment, but it never came. Despite trying to break away from generic Zeldas, it was the most half-assed, done-to-death plot of them all. Zelda's trapped because Ganon, and Link has to save her. The story was poorly told and executed. It had a ton of wasted potential. The Shrine of Resurrection was a pretty unique way to start the game. And then it was just done, and gone, and no one really cared about it. Nothing was really done with it outside of a cutscene later being like, Link's have to go bring him to the start of the game to tie this shoe's nasty up. Zelda was a delight in the memories, showing off a fun personality. I mean, look at that. Look at that cute little scoot. And look at that big old boot. E. It was fun seeing her interact with Link, each memory basically being a different emotion she'd convey. A lot of people didn't like her, but I don't know. I thought having Zelda as a failure of the legend was a nice take on it. Every other Zelda has the whole, Welp, I'm Zelda, it's time to just win with magic powers, and it was nice to see that she didn't. It was nice to see her struggle. It was nice to see, oh wait, no, oops, she did exactly that. Her ending had no impact. She was fighting Ganon for a hundred years, but she isn't older, she doesn't really appear her, and if anything, she's stronger now. The other fun story aspect of the game were the champions. Instead of Link being the solo hero, he was basically just a hired sword to help Zelda on her quest, with their ethnically diverse ragtag group of sexy fish and Amazons, and Falco from Star Fox who everyone hates. <laughs> Every memory was just a delight to view, but it left a bad taste in your mouth afterward because as soon as you finished it, you're just like, why are we, why are we not at this part? Why are we in this empty, dumb place where everyone's dead? How cool would it have been if you started the Zelda's Hired Sword and the game builds up to Ganon's takeover, at which point you see each of the champions die as you try and tame their beasts. Instead, their friendships and relations with Link form off screen, which is so sad because the small glimpses you get warm your heart. Maybe even end the game with Link losing. I mean, nowadays with DLC running rampant and make perfect sense to end it like that and have the DLC revive Link to beat Ganon. But I also believe that games should be able to have more sad endings. Be like, kid, just, just grow up. Life isn't happy. Basically, the hundred year gap was unnecessary and muddied up the story. That being said, it is very unique and refreshing that the story is mostly optional. If you don't want to experience it, good. You don't have to. The most you need to hear is the king be like, Look, man, I'm dead and I'd kind of like my diggity daughter to, you know, not be. So get on that, baby cakes. And then be on your way. And alongside your way, you get into... Oh wait, no you don't. Okay, so this is debated a fair amount. A lot of people with open world games do enjoy ambient music, but Zelda has always been a game with a large focus on music, either having howling, jamming out on instruments, or even dancing. It was a shame to go into this game and have the best part of the soundtrack be essentially a remix of a previously existing theme. Hyrule Castle is one of the few soundtracks you get to listen to outside of some piano flourishes and some college grad interpretive dance and bongo experience for fighting peeps. True, the ambient music could produce some scenes of beauty, like watching the dragon dragons in the distance as a hauntingly beautiful tune plays as you stare. But actual songs do that too. Like yeah, piano dragons are nice, but even to this day, I still get choked up when I watch the Macau scene in Majora's Mask because of how beautiful the Song of Healing is. Which too is mostly piano, but it has a melody rather than sounding like someone is just kind of feeling the room with a keyboard in front of them. The few themes they do have just aren't memorable. I can't hum much of the Breath of the Wild boss theme, but you know I'm always jamming out to that. It really was a letdown that the main takeaway songs from this title were just revisits to previous themes. The main theme was nice, which kind of makes me wish there was an Ocarina of Time-esque title screen with that floating along instead of a silent, hey check it out, I learned how to use PowerPoint. It gets me mad instead of glad, so much so that I want to hit something, but in order to do that we need to get into...
So I do actually enjoy the freedom you have with fighting enemies in this game. Having the bow as a secondary weapon was super needed, and I'm a sucker for bow combat, which I loved in this game. The bigger focus on stealth made things a lot more fun too. Distracting enemies and sneaking up on them to hopefully one-shot them took away the staleness of melee combat. A lot of people complain about the durability, and sure, it's not ideal, but here's the thing. If it wasn't in the game, the combat would have been way worse. Honestly, I kind of like having flimsy weapons mid-battle and just kind of swapping on the go real quick, but I can see why that can be a damper when you actually have like good weapons. The main issue I have with the combat mostly stems from the primary weapons. There are essentially three types of weapons. Jabbers, sword, and big sword, with a couple of joke weapons in between. But none of them really have pizzazz. You either attack normal, jump attack, or charge attack with the option to throw your weapon. There are no directional input attacks, just one standard combo for each type. There are no unique weapons in the game, they are all just a reskin of one of the three types. As you progress too, there becomes a lot less incentive to actually fight anything as you'll be breaking your weapons for worse weapons. This Zeldudu also suffers from a severe lack of a threat when you can just pause and fully heal using items, which is probably why most things can one-shot you early on. One of the big things is the flurry rush, which I'm sorry, it's just dumb. Like, maybe if there was no slow-mo, but even then it just looks awkward. Link just magnets himself towards the target and starts this weird attack animation. Counters and parries are fine, but you don't need to have these- Oh, I can't believe I got- Countered. Huh? Oh, oh right. Uh, yeah. Ah! Every time I did one, I just imagined Nintendo employees clapping for me and congratulating me using Baby Talk. It felt weird. I think if the window was shortened and you could only do it if you dodged close to an enemy, it would be passable. But as it stands, blah. But luckily, there are plenty of other ways to actually fight. The thing I've seen almost everyone talk about is enemy variety. There are roughly 15 enemy types in the game, and you really only see three of them. Those of course being the Bacobbles, Moobles, and Lizard. Hell, this game has less variety than the NES Zelda. That is not okay. Why is Nintendo getting increasingly less creative with enemies and NPCs? All Mario RPG characters are now Red Toads, all Zelda enemies are Bacobbles. Are they just... Are they saving all their creativity points for Odyssey? Plus, the worst part is you basically see them all in the first few hours of the game, so there's hardly any surprises. And I'm sorry, but how do you not have any Dark Nuts in this game? It would have been so perfect if when you finally go to Hyrule Castle, you were introduced to a new enemy. And since Dark Nuts have always been heavily combat focused, how neat would it have been if they could counter and flurry rush you? But nope, Bacobble, 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 Lizard, Moobble, that's it. Most of them aren't even that great to fight. It's funny to see a Moblin pick up a Bacoblin for the first time, but other than that, the only enemy I consistently enjoy fighting is the Lionel Huts. They're fast, they're mean, they hit like a truck, and they can have various weapon types and sport more moves outside of Here Comes the Attack! There are a few mini-boss monsters you can fight, which are pretty fun. I think the game honestly could have been better with more mini-boss types and less of the three camp dwellers. It would have made going into camp camp seem a bit more worth it since as is, it's basically just wail on three to six of an enemy and get a shitty chest. There should have been more to find and fight on. Now when I say this, I'm not saying the map is bad. The biomes and environments they have are pretty great, but there's just nothing in them. Exploring is gonna net you one of two things, either a shrine or a Korok seed, which is literal pooping. The only part of the game I thought was built tremendously was the plateau, which living up to the name, it's the height of gameplay. But unfortunately, it's right in the beginning of the game. You get four unique shrines, the run-ins with the enemy types, a mini boss, and familiarity with the environments. It was the perfect area to practice your new moves. Plus, you didn't have to go too far to find something else of interest. But when you actually get off the plateau, it's more or less the same with a bunch of space in between everything. Not good space, just empty space. Like I said, there are enemy camps, but fighting them becomes redundant and useless the further you progress. There are little puzzles for the Koroks, but those two are recycled, so after you figured out like the seven different types, it becomes more of a chore. Same goes with the shrines. There are some unique ones that are basically just what the puzzles would have been in an actual Zelda dungeon, which is fun, but there are plenty that are just here take an item or here fight the samey same again, with a few bigger areas being devoted to them, which are probably the highlights of shrines. At first, exploring was insanely rewarding, but five hours in, you always know what you're gonna find. Not to mention, there are like zero caves. Maybe one or two entrances to a shrine, but there is no spelunking to be had here. Which is a shame. Zelda was always pretty heavy on secret bombable walls leading into caves, and with how huge these mountains are, it'd be amazing to explore underground labyrinths. The torch 
barely has a use as it is. With this game though, you sometimes have those bombable walls with a shrine behind it and that's it. I will give it credit for the methods of travel. People can travel by either just sailing along with the paraglider, rocking that horseback adventure, or quick traveling to previously found locations. But you do have more creative methods as well. Shield surfing down mountains was fun on the bun and with the stasis ability, you can launch yourself through the air to cover great distances in short amounts of time. The volcanic area was probably the most fun. No other area really had their own thing outside of cross-dressing and sandstorms, and the former became a chore after the initial exhale out of your nose from the cutscene. The towns didn't do much to impress, most of them felt pretty bland and unmemorable. Like, I honestly can't remember any town names in this game. The build-ups to the Divine Beast were hit and miss. Zoras and Gerudos were great, but the other two... no. Afterwards, all it leads to is... This area is weird for me, a big old good and bad. For starters, all of the dungeons and shrines have the same motif, and that is gross. The closest thing you get to a difference in any dungeon is dark for the one in the volcano for the first part. Dungeons should stand out more so they can be more memorable. They could have changed some textures or added on some decals, something to make them pop. Hell, even in Zelda 1, you at the very least had different colored walls. You couldn't have even done that? Just samey samey same sames? These also aren't traditional dungeons. There are no walking through doors to have it close behind you and a mini boss jump out. There are just puzzles. It is unique and a bit refreshing. I actually do enjoy the Divine Beasts a good amount, but they are just so short. And each one's shtick is rotate. That's the theme. Just rotate to puzzle solve. If they were twice as long and maybe had a bit more variety and maybe some more enemies sprinkled in there, it could have been a lot better. The easiest comparison I can make is to Majora's Mask. Both games have four dungeons, each tied to a race that all focus around one big central puzzle. The ones in Majora's just wound up being larger and more complex, with the puzzles having more variety. Oh, there's fire. I guess I'll rotate this one click at a time until it's fixed. The Stray Fairies furthered exploration and provided more challenge to get through the dungeon if you desired. But in Breath of the Wild, the most you get is a chest that houses a very mediocre weapon or something. As said, the Divine Beasts weren't bad. They just looked stale and didn't really provide much challenge. I think they could have added a secondary shtick to each dungeon. Maybe in the Volcano one, we could have had like a one-hit killer stalking you in the darkness and dousing any flames you light as you try and solve more light-based puzzles. Or have the Sky Beast have a few paraglider things like dropping bombs into pipes to progress somehow. Plus, at the end of each dungeon, you fight a boss, but this time they all share the same theme, making them well, less special. Again. It wasn't, oh dang, I can't wait to see what fearsome creature this boss is gonna be. It was, oh dang, I wonder how stupid this blight will look. One dungeon that was fantastic was the final one. Hyrule Castle was amazing. If the Divine Beasts were replaced with slightly smaller castles, oh man would this game shoot up in my eyes. Hyrule Castle was a mix of a traditional dungeon with the freedom that Breath of the Wild gives you. Each room had very rare and powerful items or weapons. There were bombable walls, secret passages, and mini-bosses, and even a few puzzles to solve. But the thing was that if you wanted to, you could just go straight to the boss. The dungeon was there to essentially give you one more power-up or punishment depending on your skill before the final fight. It took me a while before I even saw every room of that place because of how massive it was and how little you need to traverse in order to get to your destination. I hope in the future they adopt this style of having the dungeon, but giving you the option of how much you want to delve into it. The only negative of Hyrule Castle is how stupid the final boss is. Yes, I get that it's cinematic, but then give me a cutscene, not... Even with those issues, the game still feels and plays fantastic, outside of Rain. Rain is stupid. I logged an easy 70 hours on my Get All Shrines file. The game was a bit of a letdown in some aspects, but surpassed others. Ultimately, it's a Zelda for those who don't want to play Zelda, while still entertaining regular fans. Climbing was surprisingly fun for something so simple. Scaling gigantic walls and stuff felt like a mini accomplishment on their own. Not to mention, so many games claim the whole, you see that, you can climb it, but don't deliver on it, so it's nice to actually have that. Which works out because, and I keep saying it, the freedom in this game allows you to travel anywhere you want first. Instead of traditional items, you get your main runes on the plateau, and you use those throughout the whole game. I kinda wish there was like a hookshot rune, or that I could use the magnet rune to pull myself towards stuff. But, regardless, not locking them behind dungeons was brilliant, and was the same reason why I loved Link Between Worlds. I got to choose what to do first. Nothing is really locked behind anything after you clear the plateau. But the thing that stands out the most? Well, I guess it's a bunch of little things. The details. There are so many tiny details in this game that give it so much charm. Elemental weapons increasing or decreasing your temperature if equipped, enemies using smaller enemies as weapons or being distracted by bombs because they just want to play soccer. Stuff that even with the game's minimal handholding, you could potentially never find. When the game first came out, I had so much fun talking with my buddies about all these neat areas, tricks, and details we discovered. 
Nintendo did a great job at not just shoving it in our face and spoiling every single thing in one go. The game was severely lacking in side quests. There's only like two neat and memorable ones, the others are all just fetch quests. But considering you can go and beat the game whenever you want, it honestly didn't bother me too much since every quest was basically a side quest outside of porking the porker. Speaking of, the fact that you can bum rush straight to the final boss is fantastic. I have done so many attempts at beating this game in under an hour, which is very possible. As it stands, my record's like an hour and 15 minutes, which sucks. But regardless, it's a blast. For starters, the final boss isn't a pushover like he is if you actually do the story mode. And prior to fighting him, you need to fight all of the Blights in a gauntlet. If you die to any of them or Ganon, back to the start for all of those fights. It's so much fun. Ultimately, I'd probably give Breath of the Wild a 9 out of 10 if I'm feeling generous. The game is not perfect, but it's a blast and definitely worth your money. Master Mode is garbage though, as the combat is not designed for damage sponges that regenerate health, but the Master Trials offer a fun design molded after one of the best Shrine Trials. I have hopes for the DLC, but knowing Nintendo, they won't deliver. Holy cow, look, it's the champs! It's new stuff with the champs! We're gonna get to go back in time and hang out with our bro, the fuckable fish, and the Amazon goddess, and we're gonna be able to tell Rivali he still sucks? This is gonna be- It's just... more... SHRINES! Oh no, spoilers and opinions ahead. In the champion's ballad, you just- FUCKING FIND MORE SHRINES, DAMN IT! Okay, so I was already hesitant of this DLC for two reasons. One, because it's Nintendo, and two, because it's Breath of the Shrines. If you didn't see Zelda with a side of salt, go check that out for my gripes with the base game. The main one, of course, being the lack of stuff to actually find. And so what does this DLC give us? Just more of the same. I do love Breath of the Wild, I've logged many an hour into this game, but god damn it, what is this DLC? It feels more like an afterthought, and it was basically presented as one. There was no trailer until the day it was released where they were just like, oh right, fuck, we said there was DLC coming out. Out for the holidays, didn't we? To start off, you can't access the DLC until you take down all the beasts. So for me, who had my speedrun file that has minimum stats and my master mode file, which was more focused on shrine hunting instead of progressing the story, it was kind of a struggle to even get started. Once you do get started, you get a pretty neat shrine quest where you get this one hit obliterator weapon that, as the name suggests, obliterates in one hit. The drawback is that you as well drop if so much as a light breeze nudges a rock into you. You run around the plateau again and clear out some camps and you're rewarded with a shrine. You do this four times and you're thinking, oh yeah, what now? Lay it on me. Bam! Statue thingies. Okay, sure, what do we got there? Oh, locations on the map we've already been to and what do we find there? You gotta be fucking kidding me. Alright, we cleared the location shrines, now we gotta get back to the beast. This is looking good. This is it! We're gonna go back in time and either play as the champs or hang out! Are you- are you serious? So you run around a place you've been to find yet more shrines to head back to a dungeon you've cleared to fight a boss you've beaten with worse equipment. You couldn't even let us fight the boss as the champs? That is some grade A bullshit, Odesio. Hell, I will give it that the shrines are a bit bigger and feel more like mini dungeons than previous shrines, which made me kinda wish they took the three shrines for each platform and rolled them into one you could access there. It would've felt a lot better than running around doing mundane tasks again. But whatever, when you suffer through doing this three more times, you're rewarded with the good part of the DLC. You do get a brand new dungeon to crawl through, and it was great. It had four rooms with puzzles in them, and you got to essentially build the Divine Beast. And every time you clear a room, the mid-stage gets filled with more baddies, so you get a nice sense of progression. Plus, at the end... You get a real final boss, and it's just great! This fight not only had a jam-tastic theme, but it was just a blast, making more use of your equipment and abilities compared to Ganon. Plus, I am a sucker for same size fights, even though the mofo shows off his growth finish. Afterwards, you're rewarded with the Master Cycle Zero, which is pretty fun, but at this point in the game, you've basically done everything, so all it's really good for is collecting Korok seeds. Ultimately, the DLC was kind of a huge letdown. It was basically what I feared. We didn't really get to go anywhere new, there were no unique enemies outside of the final boss, and you don't even get to use the obliterator anywhere else once you finish the quest, so it's just kind of useless. Hell, I couldn't even get footage of that area because I couldn't go back to it because I had already beaten it. Cass just kind of felt shoehorned in because I'm sure Nintendo got the memo that everyone wants to fuck him. Like, why does he act so surprised at each pillar? Plus, with the few cutscenes you get after re-beating the boss, it just does the same issue that the base game does. It makes you wish you weren't in this timeline and you were back in the past fending off the calamity with your team. It doesn't fix the narrative at all, it just exacerbates its issues. I don't know if there's any more DLC ever coming to 
Breath of the Wild or not, but with this in the first batch, I doubt I'd even be excited if there was. But I guess if nothing else, Kid Sidon is pretty fucking cute. And that's it. This ends The Legend of Zelda with a side of salt. I gotta tell ya, it was fun playing through these games again and reminding myself of why the series was so special to me. Journeying through these lands again has helped me feel a bit more creative, and I've started flushing out some more of my OC. I know not everyone agreed with my opinions, but the thing is, I don't really care, and neither should you. They are our opinions. I had fun with some of these games more than others, and I'm aware that various people can think differently. If you loved Twilight Princess, that's great. If you hated Skyward Sword, well hot dog that's fine too. Opinions help make us unique as people, just as so many parts of each Zelda game makes them their own. If you parrot yourself to others' opinions, you lose track of who you are. You become a ghost of your former self, and a shell of the person you admire. It's okay to be influenced, just as Zelda has influenced countless successful games throughout the years. You shouldn't be getting angry and threaten someone just for not thinking exactly the same way as you, or someone else. Strive to become your own person, someone worthy of leaving behind a legend of their own.